we started off with a language that omitted let expressions. Let's go back and add them in now. As I said before, it turns out they're surprisingly tricky. The rule that you might start off with is that to infer the type of a let expression, you first infer the type of its binding expression E1. So that gets you a type T1 and some constraints C1. Then you could add X to the static environment under that type T1, infer the type of the body expression E2, getting a type T2 and some constraints C2, and then conclude that the type of the entire let expression is T2, along with those two sets of constraints. This is a reasonable rule, and it gets many cases right. For example, suppose we wanted to infer the type of let x equal 42 in x. Well, we would go ahead and infer the type of the binding expression 42. That's a constant of type int, generates no constraints. We would then add the name x to the static environment under the type that we had inferred for the binding expression, so that's int here. And we would go ahead and infer the type of the body expression, which is x. Well, of course, that's just the name rule that we need to use for that. So that would have type int, because that's what the name is bound to in the static environment, and generate no constraints. So at the end, we would conclude that this let expression has type int, and there are no constraints. It's an easy case where the rule does work correctly. The problem comes with polymorphism. So suppose we were working with the identity function. And then we applied the identity function twice, once to an int, another time to a Boolean. Now we ought to be able to do that. That's the nice thing about polymorphic functions. You can use them at many types. That means we want the type of that polymorphic identity function to be alpha arrow alpha. We don't want it to be just int arrow int or bool arrow bool. Either of those would be too specific. Well, the problem is that the naive let rule we just gave doesn't let the identity function be polymorphic in that way. Here's what happens. It will go to put the identity function under the type alpha arrow alpha in the environment. But then later, when it is applied, well, when you apply it to an integer, that generates a constraint. That the type of that function needs to be the type of its argument, arrow something else. So the argument there is known to be an int. Therefore, that's going to lead to a constraint eventually that alpha equals int. But then when we apply id to true, we're going to get another constraint, which is that alpha arrow alpha equals bool arrow something else. So the bool there is because we have a Boolean constant that we know. And that will lead to an additional constraint during unification of the form alpha equals bool. So now we've got an inconsistency. We need alpha to equal both int and bool, and that can't happen. So what went wrong here actually is something that is so subtle that it seems right when you first see it. The problem is what we put in the environment. We said that id has type alpha arrow alpha. It means that there is a single unknown type alpha that id takes as input and returns as output. And unification then will, of course, go ahead and solve for that single type. But really what we wanted was something different. We wanted there to be many unknown types alpha. And every application of id ought to be able to use a different value for that type. So the solution to this is inspired by universal quantification in logic. You know, you can write expressions in logic like, for all x, it holds that 0 times x equals 0. So we've universally quantified that variable there to say, hey, this can range over any value that you want it to take on, apparently from some set of numbers. In type inference, we'll have the same thing. We'll have something called a type scheme. Now this is going to be written alpha dot t. Uh, and now in textbooks, you might actually see this written as for all alpha dot t using the for all quantifier from mathematical logic. I'm going to omit writing for all here, but you can think of it. 
So alpha here is going to be a type variable that is in scope in that type T. We can also extend this to a, allow more type variables as part of the syntax. So you could write alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, all the way up to alpha n dot T. And this is just like how in logic you can quantify over multiple variables too. You can say things like for all x, y, and z that there's some property of those three variables that holds. Guess what? Type schemes are part of OCaml and always have been. You just haven't seen them until now. How about the length function from the list module? List.length has type alpha list arrow int. You knew that, right? Well, guess what? I can give it a different type. In fact, a type scheme. Let my length of type alpha dot alpha list arrow int be list dot length. And that has type alpha list arrow int, but OCaml accepted my type scheme. So what's going on here is that implicitly the type scheme is always there. When OCaml outputs something like this with alpha list arrow int, implicitly any type variables that are showing up there are really quantified as part of a type scheme that OCaml just doesn't bother to print. And it doesn't bother to print it because it would just be extraneous information. It's always there. Most programmers don't need to know about it, so there's really no reason to print it out. But if you ever want to manually put it in like I did here, you actually can. Here's another example. Suppose you have the function that takes in two arguments and just returns the first one. So that has type alpha, arrow, beta, arrow, alpha. Well, I could give that a manual type annotation. That's the first of two, I'll call it. That takes in uh, an alpha and a beta. So I'm going to quantify those variables as part of the type scheme. And the type is actually alpha, arrow, beta, arrow, and that's going to be fun, x, y, arrow, x. So OCaml accepts my type scheme as an annotation there. It is correct, uh, but then just doesn't bother to print it back out as part of the output. But it's always there and always has been.